I'm very honoured, Peter, to be a Labor, the mother of CPAC, thank you, but however, as it becomes clear today as our talk, the movement which, which led to the creation of CPACs was a cooperative effort involving many people, some of whom are here today. I thought I'd begin with the introduction I used in a story I wrote about the genesis of CPACs in Linda Ann Blanchard and Leah Chan's book, Ending War, Building Peace. So this is just, if you could just um, take yourself now to, uh, to the Mills building in 6th of March, 1985. A large airy classroom in the Mills building, Sydney University, 17 fourth year social work students are filing in, chatting animatedly, keen to get going in this final year of their social work degree. I am already in the room perched beside a table with a pile of information about the community work course upon which we are about to embark. I'm welcoming the students, none of whom I've met before. My greetings perhaps reveal a touch of apprehension as I'm planning to a learning experience quite different to that usually associated with universities. We begin, and unbeknownst to us then, so does the story of CPACs. That learning experience, now 30 years ago, drew on the educational ideas of John Dewey and Paula Freira, an experiential and dialogical approach involving learning through doing. The plan was for the class to identify an issue on campus, which they saw as a problem, need or interest of the student community, and for them to take action on that issue to achieve their ends. They were to learn about community work by doing it. I'll briefly run through what happened in that class, otherwise I won't be able to draw out implications at the end for lessons we learned along the way and messages for CPACs. First of all, the emergence of SKIPS, which was the staff, the students, I'm sorry, Committee for the Introduction of Peace Studies. In those days, some of you may remember, the university calendar was divided into three terms. The community work class that I was uh, teaching ran for two terms, from early March until the end of July. 18 weeks in all, with two hour sessions every week. Not much time to carry out a worthwhile project and to do so through careful community development process. In the third week, peace was identified as the issue which the students wished to take up. But at this stage, there was no clear understanding about the meaning of peace and very little information about any peace initiatives on our campus or on other campuses. It took four, four more weeks of research and class discussion before the group decided on a priority to seek the introduction of peace studies at Sydney University as things turned out a momentous decision for CPACs. By this time, the group had a much more sophisticated understanding of peace, helped along by drawing on our contacts in the peace movement, in which I'd also been involved, including Stella Cornelius and Keith. Thank you, Keith, you came to one of our classes all those years ago. We drew on them for enlightenment and advice about understandings and strategies. We were introduced to a breadth of literature and ideas. You can't have sustainable peace without social justice, they argued. The absence of war is not enough. This was to prove, of course, as you know, a, a key theme in the history of CPACs. By mid-April, we were clear about purposes and we sought an international youth year grant to assist our activities and start building a resource library. But we needed a name to put in that submission. Quick as a flash, a member of the class, Rick Norton, I remember him, piped up skips, student committee for the introduction of peace studies. It was April the 22nd, 1985, and skips was launched. We were also a lot clearer about tactics. We decided to find out more about what was happening in different departments here at our university and to assess staff interest in joining a campaign to promote peace studies. Our contacting was surprising. It revealed to us considerable interest in the teaching of peace and conflict studies here. Interest was multidisciplinary, supportive people being identified in a wide range of departments, including government, education, history, medicine, social work and sociology, political economy, chemistry and law. Some people were already teaching courses related to peace. The notion of a separate centre for peace studies within the university was raised by several people. 
put a flag on that. All in all, we found that interest in peace was more prevalent amongst academics than we had thought. The problem had been a lack of publicity about people with what people were doing and no identified network. There was much support for the idea of a meeting to bring interested people together. Skips, that is the class of 85, called that meeting on July the 2nd of that year. Ten academics turned up, including you, Peter. And I've got a list of them here too. <laughs> An interdisciplinary approach to teaching peace-related courses was again emphasised. So also was the notion of setting up an interdisciplinary working party to establish a peace research centre, which would offer postgraduate research opportunities. A further suggestion, and one more easily attainable in the short term, was to run lunchtime seminars on peace issues. It was a very positive response to our meeting purposes. Soon afterwards, our efforts were further heartened when the research officer in the Department of Social Work, Annette Hay, I do like to pay my tribute to these people who were so helpful to us in these days, but Annette offered to collect information for us and build up a research file on peace issues, the beginning, as we saw it, of a resource centre. Okay, the next stage from that student uh, committee to a staff student committee. In September 85, the student group organised a follow-up meeting. The group was now smaller, as the original class members were off campus doing their final field work placement. I thought for a moment, gosh, I'm gonna be left holding the baby here. We had, however, enlisted the support of a handful of third year social work students, including Penny May and Joe Rosa, who became very loyal supporters of the cause. One hoped for outcome from this second meeting was the formation of a staff student working party, which would carry on the campaign. A small but enthusiastic group of staff again turned up. The multi, again, you, Peter, were there. The multidisciplinary aspect, which Skips had worked so hard to achieve, was reinforced. Staff attending from social work, chemistry, economics, government and medicine. A working party was formed and it began immediately organising a series of four lunchtime seminars on the arms race. We were now SKIPS, the staff student committee for the introduction of peace studies. Student involvement remained influential though, a very important point. Social work students, including several from the original class, took on administrative roles and organised many of the lunchtime seminars, which soon became a regular feature of our work. Seminars were a particularly useful means for catching interest and spreading the word about the group's ultimate goals, which were, of course, the promotion of peace studies and the establishment of a peace centre. Achieving these long-term goals received a huge boost when Roger, Roger Westcombe, at that time Deputy Director of International House at the University, joined SKIPS and organised a peace studies workshop in June 1986 to explore strategies. The culmination of that workshop was agreement through a formal motion that a peace centre be established at Sydney University. I well remember the euphoria I felt at that moment. I felt like skipping home. Within principal support from a wide range of disciplines, focus for the, the group was now on the detail of establishing a centre. Obtaining the agreement of the Vice-Chancellor and drawing up a constitution were key tasks. Being aware of possible opposition from the university, from the hierarchy of the university to the study of peace, we changed the name of the centre being sought to the Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies. Conflict, it seemed, having more credibility in academia. It was almost two years, though, before the long-term goal of a centre was realised. A constitution which would reflect Skip's values of participatory democracy at the same time as being acceptable to the uni administration it took months to negotiate. Letters from Skip's to the Vice-Chancellor's office went unanswered for weeks. Things dragged on. It seemed the Vice-Chancellor and other hierarchy were very unconvinced about the academic credibility of peace studies. It was clear to us we needed to rethink our strategy and seek more effective ways of achieving our goal. Someone who might help us was under our nose, would you believe, Stuart, Professor of Social Work and Head of the School of Social Department at that time. 
The department had been very supportive of the movement since its very beginnings, supplying the venue for the group's meetings, housing a resource library, and absorbing many of the day-to-day -day admin costs. Social work had always been at the heart of the cause. Roger Westcombe, now in the social work department as the admin officer, and myself, of course, were members of SKIPS. Other social work staff, though not directly involved, led a huge amount of advice and support. One of these was Stuart, at the time, as he said earlier, a member of Senate, and always, of course, a keen activist. Stuart might say that I put the hard word on him towards the end of 1987, <laughs> when I sought his involvement in the interim council, which Skips had set up whilst the constitution for a centre was being negotiated. But he responded graciously and agreed to head up the campaign, together with longtime Skips members Peter King and Bob Hunter, and Skip's convener, Igor Gonda, he wrote to the Vice-Chancellor in early February 1988, putting strong arguments for a centre and requesting a meeting. Adding further credibility to the group's efforts was the arrival of Gordon, Gordon Rodley from New Zealand, who's been mentioned already, a specialist on deterrence and disarmament. It was a well-organised group of about 10 Skip supporters that eventually met with the Vice-Chancellor on the 29th of March, 1988. After three years of trying, as Stuart said, we were quite surprised that the <laughs> Vice-Chancellor almost gave in very easily a de normal par excellence. <laughs> there is, the rest is well-known history that I needn't go into, the opening of the centre and the struggles of the infant CPACs to survive with few resources, etc. There was, however, a firm foundation on which to build the organisation. The legacy bequeathed to CPACs was more than a group of people committed to seeing it flourish. It was to do with certain values and principles which guided the work of the original student group and later the staff student group. I just want to mention three. And they're quite obvious, but I think it's worth reiterating so that we keep them in mind later. First, it was the Peace with Justice perspective, adopted initially by the student group all that time from the very first moment, it survived the challenges posed when the group expanded to include staff from many disciplines and diverse theoretical backgrounds. It was then that differences emerged as to whether the emphasis of peace work, where it should lie. For some, the emphasis was on the study of war, nuclear disarmament and deterrence. Others favoured emphasis on the structural and cultural aspects of peace and violence, such as tackling poverty, promoting democracy, and building civil society. All are important, of course. Differences of emphasis, however, sometimes led to tensions, but there remained general agreement that the pursuit of sustainable peace entailed a peace with justice perspective. It was a perspective carried over to fledgling CPACs and remains. Secondly, hand in hand with that conceptualisation of peace with the notions of interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity. From the very beginnings of the movement, cooperation between people from different and many disciplines had provided theoretical and strategic strength. Inter and multidisciplinary disciplinarity were well established aspects of the movement, modelling the way for baby CPACs. A third legacy was the importance of group maintenance. I really should emphasise this. It's so hard to keep to do this while, when you're busy and wanting to get, see action immediately. It was something the community work class recognised as crucial. Lapses in attending to group maintenance occurred later in the staff student group when differences arose about priorities and tensions were exacerbated by the frustrations of such a drawn out campaign. The message for CPACs was that both the original student group and its offspring, the staff student group, worked most effectively and happily when they did so in ways consistent with the Gandhian notion of peace as the way. It was an understanding which nurtured maximum participation, consensus decision making, sharing of responsibilities, open flow of information, and airing and negotiation of differences through fair process a way consistent, of course, also with community development processes. References to the old cliche from little things, big things grow fits this story very well, I think. I find it remarkable that it all started with a grassroots movement orchestrated by a small bunch of students in 85. <laughs>